Well, first of all, I want to say hello and welcome. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Anna, and I am the president of our student chapter of the Federalist Society here at Hillsdale. We are so excited to have you all with us here tonight, um, and we are especially honored to have Mr. Leonard Leo speaking to us tonight um, about judicial power and virtue. So before we get any further into the program, would you please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Well, it is my great privilege to introduce to you tonight Mr. Leonard Leo. Mr. Leo is the Executive Vice President of the Federalist Society, an organization of around 65,000 individuals advancing limited constitutional government. Most recently, he has advised President Trump on judicial selection, helped to manage the Gorsuch selection and confirmation process, and has served as a member of the transition team. He organized the outside coalition efforts in support of the Roberts and Alito U.S. Supreme Court confirmations and in 2004 was the Bush-Cheney presidential campaign's Catholic strategist. Leo was appointed by President George W. Bush to three terms on the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. He was also a U.S. delegate to the U.N. Council and U.N. Commission on Human Rights during the Bush administration. Leo was a recipient of the 2009 Bradley Prize, along with the other founders and directors of the Federalist Society, for his work in advancing freedom and the rule of law. He is the co-editor of Presidential Leadership, rating the best and worst in the White House, as well as the author of opinion editorials in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post. Leo holds degrees from Cornell University and Cornell Law School. He presently resides in Northern Virginia, where he and his wife Sally have raised their six children. Would you please join me in welcoming Mr. Leonard Leo. Well, thank you very much, uh, and it's a tremendous privilege to, to have been invited back to the college to speak. Uh, I was here a number of years ago on Constitution Day to deliver a lecture, and I remember well the experiences I had here on campus uh, with this wonderful student body, and I thank you for giving me the opportunity to come back. It's actually a slightly different experience because back then we didn't have a Federalist Society. Um, at Hillsdale College, and we didn't have a Federalist Society actually at any undergraduate institution. Um, we have two now, uh, and that's uh, by choice, uh, and this is one of those two. The other is Rice, and so it's, a, it's a sp especially uh, a privilege for me to be, to be here and visit with all of you. It's a great chapter, and you guys are doing wonderful work. Uh, as many of you know, it's a time of uh, real tension in, in the world of higher education. But it's heartening uh, that I can say today what one could have said at any time during Hillsdale's uh, existence. This institution is committed to academic freedom, intellectual diversity, and unbridled truth-seeking and inquiry. And of course, the Western cultural tradition and all its beauty and majesty. I hope you agree that this is the highest compliment that can be given to a university faculty, administration, and student body, and I mean it very sincerely. My topic today is the judicial power and virtue. What exactly does it mean to exercise the judicial power virtuously? The application of truth, fairness, and equality certainly have something to do with it. But what I want to do tonight is to get to an even more fundamental or elemental understanding. Judicial virtue should, at its very core, be about the faithful application of the principles and rules the Founding Fathers created to preserve the worth and dignity of every human person. And first amongst these rules and principles that preserve human worth and dignity in this great country of ours are the structural limits on governmental power enshrined in our Constitution, the structural Constitution, if you will. Judges have a profound duty to respect and enforce this structural Constitution, these core limits on government power, and virtue is not possible in the exercise of judicial power without this first. It was Justice Scalia who often warned that without the structural protections that restrain government power, guaranteed rights don't really have much to back them up. 
What gives force to those rights is not the lofty ring of the words. It is the clearly defined limits on the reach of government. Enumerated powers, decentralized authority, separate branches, checks and balances, the federalism, the sovereignty of the people, these are the elements of structure. And ultimately, they are what make the Bill of Rights more than just a wish list. I traveled far and wide as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. You can go to some pretty grim places and hear boasts about all the rights they recognize, all the UN declarations they've signed, and on and on and on. Look a little further, though, and you'll find rank and often cruel persecution. Outside of small house churches in Indonesia, state security officers photograph worshipers who are then targeted for discrimination. Buddhist monks in Vietnam and China are swept up from the streets and detained. Visit a coffee house in Pakistan or Nigeria or Egypt, and there's a decent chance you'll encounter a Christian or a minority Muslim with a story of being beaten by a mob for his beliefs while police stood by and did nothing to help. If such treatment is not directly the doing of governments in those countries, it is the doing of private actors routinely tolerated by those governments. And high-sounding declarations of rights, parchment barriers are no defense. Justice Scalia figured this out long ago before I did and taught me this basic fact. As he only would put it, every tin horn dictator in the world today, every president for life has a Bill of Rights. That's not what makes us free. What has made us free is our Constitution. Think of the word Constitution. It means structure. So if the mission is truly to protect freedom anywhere, then you are in the business of restraining the powers of government. And happily, we in the United States are still a world away from those other places where freedoms are ringingly declared and rarely honored. Hillsdale students may find this proposition relatively obvious, but not so amongst much of the left, which has had a chokehold on our legal culture for many years. For generations, when it has suited their purposes, some progressives have held in effect that the Constitution means whatever five or more members of the court say it means. In practice, this has given, what I, this has given us what I see as two trends in jurisprudence, neither of which bears resemblance to how the framers viewed the structural Constitution or our third unelected branch of government. We see the first trend in the creation of rights found nowhere in the text or structure of the Constitution, often risking a virtuous and democratic society whose elected representatives should be allowed to shape our culture. To note some examples, almost at random, Griswold versus Connecticut brought us the right of privacy so general and vague that its application is purely subjective. That in turn led to Roe v. Wade and a long line of cases affirming a right to abortion with ever-narrowing exceptions for reasonable restrictions and regulations. In similar fashion, Obergefell versus Hodges announced a right to same-sex marriage. Miller versus California limited the authority of states to restrain the production and distribution of obscene material. Everson versus Board of Education and many follow-on decisions created a sort of right to protection from religious influence in the public square. Consistent constitutional reasoning is not what ties these various landmark opinions together. On the contrary, it's their excess of nuance. The common features are vagueness, malleability, and self-aware pretenses to legal rigor. Almost invariably, we're invited to join the majority opinion in some labor journey of the mind, striking delicate balances, applying multi-pronged tests, discerning ever-evolving standards. Though it's always cast in the, independent, in, the, in the language of independent truth-seeking, somehow we always end up in the same place, an overreaching court, a court where any majority of five, exercising will instead of judgment, can decide essentially whatever they please. Now, if the goal were to avoid the whole messy business of free and open debate among the people and our elected representatives, this would certainly be the way to do it. The only problem is such an exercise of power by nine mortals, given lifetime tenure, is in my view unjust and deeply dangerously undemocratic. That's one trend in jurisprudence. The second is a tendency to overlook 
what is plainly evident in the Constitution. When you're finding things that aren't there, it's no surprise when you miss things that are there. This is most pronounced in areas where the court is called upon to enforce the structural Constitution. The separation of powers, limited enumerated responsibilities under Article I, Section 8 of the Constitution, and federalism. Failure to enforce these structural limits has brought us a nearly unlimited administrative state to which Congress has wrongly granted a mix of legislative and judicial as well as executive powers. The specifically listed legislative powers are so broadly construed that exclusive enumeration becomes almost meaningless. Permissive constructions of the power to spend or to provide for the general welfare or to regulate interstate Congress, commerce rather, have all kinds of practical consequences. They allow Congress to venture into areas that were intended to be left to the states or else free of government intervention altogether. When the court doesn't enforce even the most obvious constitutional provision, the abuses of power quickly add up. In this way, Grutter versus Bollinger brought us race-based quotas that violate equal protection under the law. The campaign finance cases, Buckley versus Vallejo and McConnell versus FEC, permit Congress to effectively restrict core political speech without the most compelling justification. Kelo versus City of New London essentially did away with the public use requirement when government employs one of its bluntest powers of all, the taking of private property. We speak often of the activist court inserting itself where it doesn't belong. In these cases, the problem is the passive court, absent where it does belong. Too often missing from the picture is what the framers envisioned, the dutiful court, exercising only its rightful and essential powers and making certain that the other branches do the same. Moreover, a truly dutiful court can only exist once its members exercise judicial virtue rather than mere judicial overreach. Of course, judicial overreach is a complicated problem and there's no shortage of excuses for it. Many writers on the subject lay blame on Congress for passing laws so vague as to leave judges no choice but to act and think as legislators. Justice Scalia raised this point in one of his dissenting opinions. He observed, fuzzy, leave the details to be sorted out by the court's legislation is attractive to the congressman who wants credit for addressing a national problem but does not have the time or perhaps the votes to grapple with the nitty gritty. Others see judicial overreach as an unavoidable result of the welfare and regulatory state. They cite decisions of the Warren and Burger Courts, which continually defined constitutional standards for new federal programs in education and housing and other areas. It has become common to see law review articles that examine court decisions from this angle, weighing social, economic, and political factors, and often discarding traditional legal analysis altogether. Chief Justice Earl Warren is said to have asked himself in scrutinizing a law, is it right, is it fair, rather than simply, is it constitutional? In some quarters, this is considered standard practice and entirely praiseworthy. Political scientists offer a third explanation for our state of judicial overreach. They point to shifts in the electoral cycle and national politics. For example, during transitional periods, when power changes hands in the elected branches, the Supreme Court tends to act in a counter-majoritarian way. In each of these attempts to account for the growth of judicial power, doubtless there's a bit of truth. But surely the problem lends itself to a simpler, simpler causal explanation. It's the one I suspect Lord Acton would settle on, and all the framers too. As usual with abuses of power, the reason is a desire for power. And that could not be further from faithful application of the framers' structural constitution. Long stretches of the Federalist Papers are meditations on just that subject. Lest anyone forget how mindful the authors of our constitution were about power and its temptations, let me turn the floor over for a moment to James Madison. This quote is from the Federalist number 51 and many of you are probably familiar with it. If men were angels, no government would be necessary. If angels were to govern men, neither external nor internal controls on government would be necessary. 
In framing a government, which is to be administered by men over men, the great difficulty lies in this. You must first enable the government to control the governed, and in the next place, oblige it to control itself. We see this commentary play out in how the framers envisioned and devised judicial power. Judicial review ensures that the structural limits on government authority will be policed and enforced by the courts. At the same time, though, the framers expected the judiciary to exercise very limited powers, leaving the heavy lifting of policy development to the political branches. The best explanation here, again worth quoting, comes from Alexander Hamilton in the Federalist No. 78. The judiciary has no influence over either the sword or the purse, no direction either of the strength or of the wealth of the society, and can take no active resolution whatever. It may truly be said to have neither force nor will, but merely judgment. A worldly man, like all his peers in Philadelphia, Hamilton surely knew that abuses of judicial power would occur. But I'm quite certain of this, he could never have imagined where we are today. The real trouble began when judicial abuses came dressed up as constitutional doctrine. A prime suspect in all of this is the legal realist school of the early 20th century. It gave us a sociological conception of law, concerned mostly with the social effects of law and courts rather than on the proper allocation of government power. Realism meant viewing the law as a means to an end, a tool in the expert hands of social engineers, and who better to do the engineering than a judge who can set policy by decree. The short of it is this. Unless the starting premise is that law has a determinate meaning, the outcome will always be unpredictable and only coincidentally related to the designs of the Constitution. You can give such legal theories any impressive sounding name you want, but here's the reality. The only name that's really going to matter is the name of the judge who decides the case. And benevolent motivation is no safeguard against pure whim. Eventually, it becomes a matter, in the best instance, of well-intentioned policymaking, and in the worst instance, of what Justice Byron Wright White memorably, memorably termed acts of raw judicial power. The re legal realism school only grew more sure, sure of itself over the years, and it fell to serious thinkers like Antonin Scalia and Robert Bork to start puncturing the balloon. We can thank them for setting legal thinking in our time back on the firm ground of originalism and textualism. By sheer force of argument, they and others like them became a commanding presence in the debate. From there was a short step to originalist judges on the federal bench appointed by President Reagan and by both Presidents Bush. Not every nominee made it through all the way, and some of us remember the treatment of Judge Bork as most ruthless. But some exemplary just justices have joined the court. And better still, and at the present moment, we can be hopeful that others will follow. The short of the matter is that to exercise judicial power virtuously is to appreciate that the most essential work has already been done for us by as astute and wise a collection of men as ever assembled. Some jurists these days like to hold forth about changing times and all the various features of modern life that the framers couldn't possibly have foreseen. What they miss is the timeless insight reflected in that document. Above all, the understanding of history and human nature that is at the core of constitutional structure that allocates and limits government authority. Since there are very few constraints on the judicial power that can be invoked easily and regularly, more often than not, the exercise of virtue on the part of a judge will be a matter of volition rather than force or some set of temporal incentives. And that makes the assessment of character very important in the business of judicial selection. I have witnessed the importance of understanding and practicing judicial virtue most directly and palpably in the judicial confirmation process. Most recently, the battle over the Gorsuch nomination was largely a clash of visions 
about the role of government and the scope of its power. The left opposed his nomination, in good part, because his judicial philosophy evidenced a skepticism about a boundless administrative state in light of our system of the separation of powers. Gorsuch saw a role for the court in policing those powers, and one can trace concern about lawless administrative discretion going all the way back to any number of provisions in Magna Carta, and the structural constitution here at home carries the theme forward. Our newest justice, Neil Gorsuch, is among a good many legal jurists who stress the importance of the structural constitution. That will be a welcome influence on the court in keeping with the wisdom of his predecessor. Here's how the president put it in the swearing in of Justice Gorsuch. Over the past two months, the American people have gotten to know, respect, and truly admire our newest member of the United States Supreme Court. In Justice Gorsuch, they see a man of great and unquestioned integrity. They see a man of unmatched qualifications. And most of all, and most importantly, they see a man who is deeply faithful to the Constitution of the United States. He will decide cases based not on his personal preferences, but based on a fair and objective reading of the law. That is a concise job description that covers a lot of ground. Meet all the standards those words imply, and you will fill every role in every circumstance. When you think about it, after all, there's nothing terribly complicated about the virtues alluded to here needed by every great judge to hold firmly to the application of the core principles of our constitutional order because they perfectly match the cardinal virtues. Prudence, the first virtue, St. Thomas describes, St. Thomas Aquinas describes this as wisdom concerning human affairs and also as having right reason with respect to action. We need two types of knowledge when serving any situation, knowledge of the moral principles guiding human nature and an understanding of the circumstances at hand. It's the combination that gives us sound judgment. Then there's justice. At its core, this embodies the constant and permanent determination to give his or her uh, rightful due. It's the virtue that blinds us to anything and everything except equality before the law. Then there's temperance, the strength of character to stand above the seductions of power, status, and acclaim. No one ever given a robe and gavel is unfamiliar with those temptations. And when a justice of the court gives into them, it's not a very inspiring sight. And then the fourth virtue, fortitude, the courage to stand firm in our convictions and our duty against all pressure and adversity. If a justice of the Supreme Court cannot be counted on to show complete fidelity to the Constitution and laws of the United States, then how can we expect that anyone can in government? One final note about these virtues. They define the ideal, and therefore no one is ever going to be the perfect exemplar of any of them. On the other hand, we Americans above all know how close to the mark an, an inspired collection of people once came. But for them, we would not today have one of the greatest works of human wisdom, the Constitution of the United States. It has never been, and ne never will be, too much to ask that judges in our country exercise their power virtuously through honorable adherence to the structural constitution, and in so doing, to bolster the worth and dignity of every human person. Presently serving jurists have enduring examples to follow, injustices whose reputations still command respect and always will. Faithfulness is always at a premium, and never more than today in the current search for men and women who will take up and live up to that obligation. The good news is that a Neil Gorsuch and a number of lower court judicial appointments from the past year, we already have found a number of them. And the great news is that many more are on the way. Thank you all very much. Happy to take uh, questions.
Thank you so much for coming. Um, my question is, uh, with the death of uh, Antonin Scalia, um, do you foresee, uh, as we continue on into the future, do you foresee jurisprudence getting better? Um, or do you feel like the idea of textualism is going to die with Scalia? Uh, well, there are a couple of observations I would make about that. First, I think at the end of the day, uh, the future of, of textualism and originalism, originalism is really going to depend on, on um, future presidents and senates. In other words, you know, I think it was Reagan who once said, you know, personnel is policy. And uh, ultimately, uh, we have a number of members of the court presently who are textualists. Um, a fewer number who are originalists, but still a number who are originalists. Uh, but, that, but that balance can change. Uh, that balance can change with, with new presidents who um, don't ascribe to that judicial philosophy, don't have people around them who ascribe to that judicial philosophy. And it can certainly change with senates uh, that uh, treat the court as a political body and are not interested in um, in the blind administration of justice, but rather look at results in cases. So uh, that's, that's a challenge. Um, I think that at least the early returns on Justice Gorsuch are that he uh, does, in fact, ascribe to textualism and originalism. He said as much in his confirmation hearings. Uh, certainly his body of work before his nomination evidenced that. Uh, there have been several, uh, uh, a couple of opinions where he has discussed originalist principles and several oral arguments where he has asked very probing questions relating to the original meaning of the Constitution. Uh, I think all of that is uh, very positive. Uh, and I think um, pretty consistent with, with what Justice Scalia's views of jurisprudence were. But again, you know, we have a court where I think at least, uh, at least two of the justices uh, are over 81. And there is going to be a lot of um, changes in the composition of that bench over the next decade or so. Uh, and we should not take for granted uh, the renaissance we've seen in originalism and textualism, it can be taken away from us just as quickly and easily as it was uh, regained. Thank you so much, Mr. Leo. That was very enjoyable and, and uh, insightful. It seems that you, you called it a renaissance. And is it true then that one of the key elements in this renaissance has to be law school teaching. And is that something that you've seen shift in the direction of originalism and textualism? Or are law, law students receiving their education in that through the Federalist Society, through reading Scalia and Bork, reading you, listening to you? Are they receiving it outside of law school? Or have you seen a shift in teaching and instruction at law schools? There's been a shift in law school teaching. Um, there is a greater degree of discussion in the classroom itself about originalism and textualism and about the structural constitution. But make no mistake, the reason why there is that shift is because of the external forces that have come to bear upon the law school academy. There would be little need for professors to um, to talk about those things in the absence of wonderful Scalia opinions and, and dissents. There would be no reason for law school professors to tip their hat to a conversation about originalism in the absence of a Federalist Society that was having a meeting on it at 4 p.m. that same day. So I think some of what's happened here is law professors want to control some of this conversation. 
They don't want to cede the entire discussion to these external forces, and so they let it into their classroom. And so I think there has been some change. Now, if you want to see a more lasting change, if, if you want to see, I think, a greater foundation laid for these rule of law principles, that's a project that extends well beyond the law school. That starts, well, it starts here. Uh, it starts at colleges like Hillsdale, who place a premium on our Constitution and on uh, the bedrock principles of our republic. It, it, it falls upon high schools to have a proper understanding of what civics education really means. How about take out the Constitution and read that, you know, for civics education. So, so you know, we need all of that. Uh, we, we, need, we need the shift and we need to preserve that renaissance in the law schools, right? Because, because that's where the opinion leaders for the law come from. But as I've just mentioned, there's a political component to this. And, and that means that you need to have a broader citizenry or body politic that's invested and bought into the game. And, and that's where this broader educational enterprise needs to really um, take root. Supreme Court justices earlier, do these at all promote judicial virtue or would the removal of life tenure at all improve judicial virtue in the court system? I've never been of the view that getting rid of the life tenure would have much of an impact on judicial virtue. Uh, now, why do I say that? Well, first of all, um, uh, uh, if you look at state Supreme Courts around the country, where there are often limited terms or elective terms, uh, that doesn't seem to affect uh, uh, their behavior. Um, and so I'm, I'm, not, I'm not convinced that limiting terms will affect behavior. I guess one can make the argument that if you limit terms, you could, you could get rid of really bad people sooner. Um, but the fact of the matter is that if you have a political process that um, isn't appointing the right people in the first place, that doesn't do you a whole lot of good either. So my operating principle has generally been the most important thing you can do to create a pro-rule of law, pro-originalist, pro-textualist, pro-structural constitution atmosphere is basically to have political officials who care about that stuff. And you know, we just went through a presidential election, which I, you know, for the first time in my memory, was really all about that, right? You know, um, uh, a week after the election, um, I was summoned up to New York to sit down with the president-elect and talk about what the Supreme Court process was going to be like and, you know, winnow lists down and all of that good stuff. And, and the first thing he said in the meeting was, you know, this, this, you know, this issue really had consequence. And he rattled off the numbers. He knew the numbers. 22% or 23% of the American people who voted said that the uh, Supreme Court was, was the most important issue in this election, and it was 60% of Republicans. Those, those numbers are historic highs. So this was the first time, at least in my memory, that issues of judicial power, right, and the role of the court and, and what was at stake with the court was actually squarely presented to the American people, and many of them reacted in a way that historically they hadn't. Certainly having an empty chair at the court uh, brought the issue home for people. But, you know, that issue was brought home for people also because we had a presidential candidate who made it a big issue, talked about it everywhere he went, put out a list of, you know, 21 names to say to everybody, this is, this is the list from which I'm going to pick. These are the kinds of people I want. This is what principles those people reflect. That was a big deal. So it brought it to a head in a way that we had never seen before.
Thank you so much for coming tonight, sir. Uh, you mentioned the unpredictability of decisions as one of the problems with the legal realist school. And insofar as some of the precedents you mentioned have already been decided, how should a court that wishes to restore some integrity to the structural barriers in the Constitution approach precedents that in the past uh, have allowed uh, the government to step beyond its bounds while at the same time giving due respect to sort of constancy in legal decisions? Well, you'll get, <laughs> that's a tough question, right? Because you'll actually get a variety of different perspectives about this uh, within the conservative movement, actually. So, you know, um, in fact, some of you may be familiar with, with a bit of the tension, it was friendly, but a bit of the tension that existed between Justices Thomas and Scalia on this subject. Justice Thomas was what often jokingly called himself a faint-hearted originalist, right, because he had a little more, uh, a little more willingness to accept a long-standing precedent that, um, uh, you know, that, that, uh, uh, that expectation interest had been built around and, uh, and where there was at least some kind of a discernible judicial standard, right? Um, and, and Justice Thomas was, has from time to time been more of the view of, nah, if the president's wrong, we just overturn it. Uh, and so there's, there's a bit of a, a spectrum within the conservative movement about what role precedent ought to play. Um, I, I tend to be on the side of thinking that um, uh, precedent that, that cannot be uh, justified uh, uh, by the original meaning or by textualism uh, is ultra vires and basically ought to be uh, set aside. Um, it, it, it harkens back to something that Bentham said, who I normally don't like to quote, but I think he said that which Precedent is that which um, someone invokes, uh, uh, which is untrue. In other words, you know, it, it, or something, words to that effect. Um, and, and so um, I, I think there's something to be said for that. I mean, basically, um, if, it's, if it's wrong, uh, then it needs, then there's a very strong argument that it should be eliminated. I, I would say that um, there, are, there are variations in, in the court's jurisprudence on this. You know, for example, I think that um, uh, certainly a Supreme Court decision that has no discernible judicial standard uh, does not deserve to be treated with the respect that stare decisis would normally accord it. So, for example, I don't know what the undue burden standard is in abortion jurisprudence. I have no idea what that is, um, uh, and and uh, and so. That's a precedent which I, I just think should get zero weight. Um, there are other precedents in the Commerce Clause area where there are judicial standards. Um, we can have a debate about whether that's the right way to read the clause, the interstate commerce power or not, but they're standards, they're discernible, they're uniform, they create expectation interests, um, and, and you can make an argument that in that instance if you're going to start wiping precedent away, um, you know, you probably need to do it in a more measured fashion, um, if at all. So it, I know that's sort of an amb ambiguous answer. I tend to fall on more of the Thomas side of the spectrum, <clears throat> but I think there's a fair debate in the movement about the proper role of stare decisis. Thanks so much for your time tonight, sir. I really appreciate it. My question for you is uh, concerning the relationship between federal law and state enforcement of those laws. Um, and I wanted to ask you how you feel about the growing discrepancy and or divide between the uh, federal law concerning immigration and state enforcement of those laws. And how do you see that adapting and evolving over the rest of the uh, Trump pres presidency? Well, that's a good question because, I mean, that current debate, which is often described in, you know, political or policy terms, is really, uh, is, is really a, um, really cuts to the core of our constitutional system in a lot of ways, right? I mean, um, I, I think our framers envisioned a system where basically uh, uh, there were certain very discreet enumerated powers and um, Congress has authority to regulate those areas. 
and uh, states have a duty to respect congressional authority uh, in those in those areas, uh, and they can't make um, decisions for themselves. They can't decide to refuse to respect or enforce a federal mandate in an area where Congress has <coughs> plenary authority or specifically delegated authority. And obviously in areas like immigration, right, where, where you're dealing with questions of naturalization and citizenship and um, national security and control of our borders, uh, th those are federal questions. And, and um, states and localities have a duty to respect federal prerogative in, in those areas. And so to answer your question um, in a very practical way, uh, I think Jeff Sessions, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, got it right, right? Sue the state of California. Uh, and, and, you know, you do that because, um, uh, you know, there's an assertion of congressional authority, federal authority, that needs to be respected. Um, states need to be really careful about this, right? Because the, the allocation of, of, of national and state powers is very delicate. And I think once states start um, ignoring those balance of powers, right, it may, it may cut in their political favor one day, but will very much cut against them another day. You know, this is reminiscent of the, that, that one of those closing scenes from A Man for All Seasons where, you know, St. Thomas More is at Roper, I think, talk about cutting down all the trees and what's left, right? You know, you, you, as a state, you want to be very careful about eliminating these, these structural protections, even though there might be some short-term political gain um, by doing it, in this case, ignoring the federal government's mandates with respect to, to immigration. So I, I think that's the first question always has to be, what's the congressional authority under Article I, Section 8? Is it there? If it is, states have to basically respect it. This will have to be the, this will have to be the last question of the evening. Thank you for your talk. I was struck by the word uh, virtue in your talk. And I know virtue is uh, taking a beating. Isn't that required when you go to Hillsdale? I thought I had to use the word virtue. Right <laughs> yes. <laughs> you know, virtue signaling, the good. virtue this, virtue that. Um, it's it's uh, taking a bit of a beating. I was also struck by your um, point about the need for a citizenry of a, of a certain character. And so I'm wondering, you know, what in your judgment are some of the best, most practical, most effective ways to actually foster virtue um, in a citizenry, you know, such that citizens understand it, uh, love it, and practice it? Well, for me, first and foremost, would be faith and family. Uh, I think uh, an understanding of virtue or of the good, as you would put it here, uh, can be realized um, most readily, read it readily uh, through a deep spiritual life, through a development of a friendship, a true friendship with God. Uh, and so I think that first and foremost is uh, extremely important. Uh, couldn't say that at too many colleges, but you can say that here. Uh, secondly is family, right? We've, you know, the concept of subsidiarity has been with, with mankind for a long, long time, and there is something practically useful about it, right? I mean, you know, we know it works. And so you, 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 you want to try to inculcate values at, 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 at the most decentralized core level that you can. And you ha intact families are really, really important for the development of, of, of a virtuous citizenry. And every major political commentator and writer has, has recognized that. Uh, and then you just sort of gradually work your way up to the local community and so forth. But family and faith are really the two most, most important things. And it's no coincidence that in the Western cultural tradition, right, as family and faith waxed or waned, so did, so did a more virtuous 
uh, citizenry and more virtuous leadership. Uh, I'll end on this note, because I think this is a good question to end on. Um, that's the great thing about your project here. You know, um, many of you probably did come from intact families who cared about your education and your rearing, and many of you obviously uh, have a faith of some kind or another, belief in God, um, make an effort to develop a deep spiritual life, a friendship or relationship with God. Um, what's great about this institution is that it takes all of those things that, those, those foundational blocks that were laid in the earlier parts of your life, and it, it allows that to flourish and build upon it. And so um, you're getting a great education here for four years. Um, please, you know, um, use it for good when you leave. Find, I mean, you know, you'll have your jobs, and uh, that may be to advance the free market or to, uh, to serve people in, in some particular profession or another, but you're also all citizens, and you also are all going to have duties to um, maybe, maybe raise raise children who um, will respect the principles you're learning about here. Maybe, maybe that's not your calling. Maybe the calling is, is, is to work within a community uh, of other people uh, and inculcate these values uh, when you get out of here. But um, uh, you're, deeply in, you're, you're deeply involved in this project and the education you've had um, is a tremendous privilege because it gives you unique ability uh, to help to advance uh, our country's uh, principles into the future. So I'm very grateful for um, Hillsdale being here and especially grateful that um, there are people like you who want to populate this institution and hopefully go out and, uh, uh, and apply uh, um, all the principles and um, virtues that you've uh, learned about here. So thank you very much. It's a pr pleasure for me to be here. <laughs>